Welcome back. I'm Ofer Goldberg, and today I'm going to be talking about reproduction, recruitment, and the connectivity of tropical coastal ecosystems. Well, like life elsewhere, reproduction is an essential part of life in the ocean. In this lecture, I want to introduce you to the reproduction, recruitment, and population connectivity of key organisms associated with tropical coastal ecosystems. To begin with, I want to discuss the key differences of these processes between life in the ocean and life on land. I then want to move on to discussing the different modes of reproduction. Not all organisms re reproduce in the same way. And as you will discover, there is a huge variety of different forms of reproduction. Well, why there is such a variety is also a question, and that's the focus of the next section of this lecture, when we explore the advantages of different modes of reproduction. In this case, the difference between sexual versus asexual reproduction, and the differences between brooding versus broadcasting of your offspring. These topics will then naturally move on to uh, one of the most extraordinary phenomenons in tropical oceans, and that is the phenomenon of mass spawning. And that will then lead to a discussion of the importance of reproduction and recruitment to the dispersal of organisms, as well as the inherent impacts of these processes on aspects such as population structure. Well, let's begin with this first question. What's the big difference between the reproduction of marine organisms versus those living on land? Well, the first and most obvious difference is that water is far more abundant in the ocean than on land. As a consequence of this difference, the gametes, or sex cells, of marine organisms are often directly released into the water column. And because the desiccation of gametes is not so much of a problem in the ocean, the complex structures or genitalia that are required for internal fertilization and the protection of of uh, those early stages from desiccation are far less developed in marine organisms. There are also other differences between oceanic and terrestrial environments. Another is that conditions are far more constant in ocean settings, in most cases, due to the greater thermal inertia of water as compared to air. This essentially means that oceanic environments are subject to far less variability and extremes of temperature. Also, gas and salt concentrations tend to also be very stable. Lastly, because of the greater buoyancy force generated within ocean environments, marine organisms can disperse large distances by floating, a situation that's not always possible on land. One of the consequences of having less water is that dispersal distances on land are far less than those in the ocean. And a direct result of this is that there are a few species or types of animals that are found universally across the planet. Take mammals, for example. There are very different types of mammals within the Australian terrestrial environment, as opposed to those in the African and South American uh, environments. By contrast, the greater dispersal distances of marine organisms mean that many species can be found almost globally within temperate tropical or polar environments. For example, the thread-friend butterfly fish, Chetodon auriga, is found in Southeast Asia as well as the Indian and Pacific Oceans. This range is rarely the case for terrestrial species. These differences have major ramifications for the structure of marine populations, resulting in different problems and solutions when it comes to their management. Of course, there are also other factors which can influence the spread of species within ocean environments. One of those is the length of larval life, which varies considerably among marine organisms. Many sea squirts or ascidians, for example, have larval lives that may be less than a day in length, and consequently, they only disperse short distances from parent to where they eventually settle. By contrast, many organisms have long larval lives that may stretch to months in length. And in these cases, dispersal distances can be considerable, hundreds of kilometres, not thousands. 
These are important issues that have ramifications for management of marine populations, especially those in tropical coastal ecosystems. We'll come back to these issues at the end of this lecture when we talk about the consequences of reproductive modes within the ocean. Let's now talk about the reproduction of marine organisms. Reproduction, as I'm sure you know, is a biological process by which new individuals are produced. It is a fundamental feature of life on Earth, and in broad terms, reproduction can be split into three main types. The first is asexual reproduction, which involves identical replication of a single parent. The genes of the offspring come from a single individual. The second is parthenogenesis, which is really a form of asexual reproduction that involves the growth and development of embryos from an egg without fertilization. And the third category is sexual reproduction, which requires the involvement of two individuals that contribute gametes that then combine to form the next generation. Asexual reproduction is a mode of reproduction which offspring arise directly from a single organism by cloning and inherit the genes of that parent only. The growth of coral colonies, for example, occurs largely through the fission or division of existing coral polyps to create individuals, one polyp splitting into two. This is a picture of the coral Goniastria aspera. Originally there was only a single polyp, which then eventually divided to form other individuals, all genetically identical. New polyps tend to be found along the edge of small colonies like this. Asexual reproduction is found in a wide variety of animals and plants, including sea cucumbers, starfish, flatworms, corals, sea anemones, and related organisms. This form of reproduction is very common among marine plants as well, with algae such as calopa producing runners, which can separate from one plant leading to production of another plant. In a similar way, new coral colonies will form from pieces of colonies broken off during storms. Reproduction by fragmentation is extremely important in some reef environments, with populations of corals often having low genetic diversity due to the fact that they have come from small fragments of a few individuals on a reef. Parthenogenesis is a form of asexual reproduction in which growth and development of embryos occur without fertilization of the egg. The word parthenogenesis literally means virgin birth. Although it's rare, it is found in a wide variety of marine organisms, including plants, flatworms, copepods, and some vertebrates, including sharks. Individuals produced as a result of parthenogenesis often have the full set of chromosomes, despite the fact that fertilization has not occurred. There are a number of ways that the full set of chromosomes is restored. In some situations, there are distinct advantages of being able to produce asexually. The first advantage is that animals can live in isolation and reproduce without having to find another partner. Asexual reproduction also produces a perfect copy of the parents, which can be advantageous when parents are optimally configured to a constant environment. Asexual reproduction can also result in many offspring produced very quickly, and there are advantages in that there is no wastage of gametes or energy like that seen uh, during sexual reproduction. But what are the drawbacks or disadvantages of asexual reproduction? Well, one significant drawback is that asexual reproduction results in offspring that have very low variability. And this can be a big disadvantage in an environment that changes constantly. The idea being that fit individuals will be fit to one environment but not another as the environment changes. In this regard, sexual reproduction is highly advantageous in environments that show variability in space and time. Let's now turn to a discussion of sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is the biological process by which organisms create offspring that have a combination of the genetic material of two parents. Each of the parents contributes half of the genetic material that make up the offspring by creating haploid gametes or sex cells. 
These sex cells then combine with those of another parent through the act of fertilization. In some species, the gametes will differ in size, with the parent that produces the smaller sperm or microspore being known as a male, and the parent that produces the ova or the egg or the megaspore being known as a female. In cases like these where the two gametes differ greatly in size, the species is referred to as anisogamous. In some species, however, the gametes do not differ in size or appearance and are referred to as isogamous. Many single-celled algae are isogamous. There is a great variety in the way organisms reproduce sexually. For example, while many species have individuals that produce one or the other type of sex cell, there are a large number of organisms which can produce both types of sex cells. In the case where individuals have separate sexes, species are referred to as gonochoristic or dioecious. In situations where individuals can produce both types of sex cells, both egg and sperm, the species are referred to as hermaphrodites. Interestingly, there are different forms of hermaphrodites. As we have just discussed, many species in the ocean can have both tissues, both the testes and ovaries in the same body. Other hermaphrodites, however, may have different sexual tissues at different times of their life cycle. And these are referred to as sequential hermaphrodites. In the case where species start off life as males and turn into females, the type of sexual reproduction is referred to as protandrous hermaphrodism, which essentially means male first. In other species, individuals may start off life as females and turn into males later, and this is referred to as being protogynous hermaphrodites. Protandrous hermaphrodites start off life as males, and at some point in their life cycle, they change into females. There are many examples of protandrous marine organisms, including tenophores, flatworms, and some gastropod mollusks. Of course, the most famous protandrous hermaphrodite are the clownfish, such as those featured in the movie Nemo. In this group of fish, which live mutualistically with a large number of sea anemones, individuals recruit from the plankton into sea anemones and start life as males. Usually, anemones will have resident individuals, the largest and most aggressive of which is a female. Less mature and smaller clownfish consequently are male, except for this lead female. If the lead female dies or is removed, however, the next in line, the next largest male anemone fish, changes into a female. This type of situation may be advantageous for situations in which habitat, that is, large sea anemones, is somewhat restricted. Consequently, it's important that clownfish have some flexibility uh, in their sexual type so that populations don't accidentally end up consisting only of males or only females. It is interesting to think about the advantages of protandry versus protogeny. In this case, there is some advantage to being a male when you're small and a female when you're large. Have a think about what the advantages might be either way. Many other species have the reverse of protandry, starting off life as females and becoming males only when they're dominant within social groups. Fish that have large territories in which they dominate groups of females or harems tend to be protogenous. In this case, individuals recruit from the plankton as females and are dominated for most of their life by one to several male fish. When those dominant males, however, are removed from the population or die, the largest female will then turn into a male. Some of these changes can be quite dramatic. One of the most prominent examples of protogeny or protogynous hermaphrodites are parrotfish. In this case, males are brightly coloured to emphasise their dominant position within a population, often fighting with other males from other groups and maintaining a pecking order within their own. Females, on the other hand, are often drab and, and camouflaged. 
However, over a few weeks following the death of a male, the largest female of a population can rapidly change her colours and behaviour as well as her physiology to become the dominant male. Professor Peter Mumby will pick up on this fascinating part of biology as relates to one of the important herbivores of coral reefs. Now, protandry can be found in a large number of other organisms, including isopods and echinoderms. There are many other forms of reproduction in the ocean. One group, which is especially important to coastal ecosystems, are the marine angiosperms. These are flowering plants which have reinvaded coastal environments over evolutionary time. And their life cycles are not too different to flowering land plants, complete with flowers and fruits. The picture here is the flower of a seagrass, which has stringy pollen uh, that is carried from one place to the other, from anther to stamen, by water currents. That is, there are no pollinators involved. Mangroves also have flowers that have pollen and have transfer and fertilisation using bird and insect pollination. Viviparry, or live birth, is also common among mangroves, where fertilisation and development of the juvenile plants occurs on the parent plant, where they receive nutrition and nourishment. At the end of this phase of their development, they drop off the tree and float a short distance before being implanted into the soft sediments, at which point a new tree begins to grow. In this photograph, a number of developing individuals can be seen. Note that each one of these is genetically distinct from the parent, uh, given that a separate fertilisation event has occurred in each case. Sexual reproduction provides some advantages for situations in which the environment is varying in time and space. By allowing the remixing of genes uh, from different individuals, populations of organisms that reprodu reproduce sexually tend to have greater amounts of genetic variability. This enables populations to better track environmental change. As discussed, there are a number of drawbacks associated with having to reproduce sexually. Having to find another member of your species can be difficult in some situations. Competing for mating opportunities can be expensive in terms of time and resources. And creating a greater variety of gametes can lead to some gametes being unfit relative to the environment. And this can lead to what is often referred to as uh, gamete wastage. Well, I've subjected you to quite a bit of important terminology with respect to the different ways that marine organisms reproduce. Consequently, it is probably time for you to check your understanding of these terms before we go and discuss some of the more general features of marine and coastal life cycles. I also want you to contemplate the different advantages associated with the variety of ways that marine organisms reproduce. When you've done this, begin the next part of this lecture.